Thank you. So thank you everyone for coming. Welcome. Depending on what part of the world you're in, it's morning, afternoon, or evening. Greetings to all. This is the monthly breakfast co-sponsored by the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the City University of New York Dispute Resolution Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'm Maria Volpe. I'm a professor at John Jay, where I also direct the Dispute Resolution Program. This is our 254th breakfast since 9-11 when I started them. We met in person until uh, April 2020. Starting April 2020, we um, switched to this virtual format due to the pandemic. Many of you have asked whether we will be returning to in-person. For the time being, we remain virtual. We'll let you know if and when we switch back. Um, given this, the success of this new format, it looks like we'll probably continue the virtual format with uh, some occasional in-person events, but we're still working on the technology in the room, so we'll keep you posted. Uh, each month, these breakfasts are made possible by a wonderful team of colleagues that I work with, including Julie Denny, uh, Matthew Latimer, Nikki Borofsky, and Emily Skinner. Before we switch over to our wonderful speaker, who is up very early in California, Grand Lum, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Emily Skinner, who is the president-elect of ACRGNY, for a very brief announcement on Mediation Settlement Day, and then um, we will uh, introduce Grand Lum. So, Emily, take it away. Hello, thank you, Maria. Good morning, everybody. My name is Emily Skinner. I'm the president-elect uh, for ACR GMY, and I wanted to invite everybody to join us for Mediation Settlement Day this year. This year's theme is community engagement, and we derived this theme from thinking and reflecting on Chuck Newman's impact uh, and his legacy on the ADR, uh, the ADR, ADR community. Um, he was a part of the Roundtable Breakfast convener. He was a former ACR GMY president and a mentor in our community. And with his passing, ACR GMY has named an award in his honor. And so every year um, from now on, on Mediation Settlement Day, we will now bestow the Chuck Newman Award for impact in the ADR community. Um, we'll, and it will be for an individual or an organization. This year, we're honoring um, the New York Peace In Institute. Um, for their impact, and we invite you to join us. It's a going to be a virtual event um, Wednesday, October 26th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And so I really hope everybody can join us. I'll drop the link in the chat so that you guys can register and also read. Thank you, Nikki. So that you guys can read a little bit more about um, the New York Peace Institute and a little bit more about Chuck and the agenda. And so I look forward to seeing everybody there. And now I will pass the mic over to Linda Ortiz to introduce our, our guest speaker today. Hello, my name is Linda Ortiz and I'm a conciliation specialist at the Department of Justice Community Relations Service. I'm so excited to be here this morning and to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, Grant Lump. Grant is a senior partner at the Rebuild Congress Initiative Program of the Harvard Negotiation Project and Issue One. Previously, he was the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs at Menlo College in Atherton, California. Prior to joining Menlo, he was Director of Divided Communities Project at the Ohio State University Moritz College School of Law. Grant was nominated by President Barack Obama and confirmed by the Senate in 2012 as a Director of the Community Relations Service, an agency which I work for currently within the Department of Justice. Before joining the Community Relations Service, Grant Lum was a clinical professor at the University of California Hastings School of Law, where he directed the Center for Negotiation and Dispute Resolution. He has authored numerous books. His latest is called America's Peacemakers, the Community Relations Service and Civil Rights, which won the 2020 International Institute for Conflict Resolution and Resolution Outstanding Book Award. Others include the negotiation fieldbook, Tear Down the Wall, Be Your Own Mediator in Conflict. 
He earned a bachelor's degree in psychology from USC Berkeley and a law degree from Harvard. I'd like to share a personal note here. Um, this is really interesting, especially in the times that we're in right now. During Grant's time as a director at the Community Relations Service, he was a visionary. He cared about his staff and he believed, really believed in the agency's mission. And I can clearly remember 10 years ago when he introduced the idea of using technology to facilitate meetings and, and to mediate, who knew? <laughs> and of course, embracing change is sometimes challenging, but Grant knew that the use of technology was a tool. A lot of us, including you know, myself included, how will this really work? Can this really, really work? And look at our world today. So I'm grateful for his presence among us today. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Grand Lum. Well, th thank you very much, Linda. It is uh, wonderful to see you and it's wonderful to see uh, everyone here today. I see we have folks from Brazil and uh, from India. This is uh, really awesome here. And uh, thank you, Linda. I had forgotten that I introduced the, the whole mediating online and meeting online. I, I think it felt very weird uh, at the time. And look, look where we are today, right? We're so much of it. Uh, is going on. People don't want to go come back to, you know, we, um, Maria was talking earlier about whether to take these uh, meetings, uh, these, these monthly meetings on back to in person. Um, and, I, and I know we have Nikki Borofsky from JAMS and, um, you know, they talked about it for years too, about going to, to mediation online, but it now no one, very few people want to go back uh, to, to in person. Um, I do want to say, you know, I've been a part of the listserv for years and years. I think I, I remember emailing Maria, I think, I don't know how many years ago to, to get on here and to see that you've had 254 sessions. Um, you know, the list of folks is, is tremendous. Uh, good friends, uh, you know, Anthony Wanis St. John, who was a, who's a good friend of, of mine. I saw Layla Love has spoken. And of course, uh, Reynaldo Rivera, the uh, RD from New York, has, has been on a couple of times. So I feel very uh, privileged uh, to to be one of the uh, folks on that Google Doc uh, who, who has now uh, sp spoken to to you all. Uh, let, let me start by saying, you know, it is, it's um, a real privilege to discuss uh, my work at uh, and the, our work. And I'm, I'm really actually really thrilled to see so many CRSers in, in uh, online, online today. I think I saw Mildred, uh, Charles, and Matthew was on earlier. There might be a few other folks, and I, there's certainly some familiar faces uh, as well. But it, to me, I, I welcome a dialogue today. Uh, it's a real treat to be able to speak about the work with practitioners, uh, folks who've been doing uh, the, the work here. And I'd start by saying, I think this is such an important time for all the work that we do uh, in dispute resolution, uh, in conflict resolution, given the polarization uh, that's going on in this country uh, today. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, when I worked with Linda and, and with Matthew and with others, we didn't. I don't think we used the word depolarization very much. That was not the that term that we would have used. Uh, today, uh, you know, we live in a a world where that is dramatically the case, and and the challenges uh, that we face uh, in our politics uh, when it comes to issues of race, uh, gender, and sexual orientation, and gender identity, um, and. So I, I, I welcome that as part of how, how we speak about and how we think about the, the work. I just want to say a little bit of how I even got here, just, to, just as a way of how does one get into conflict resolution? I, like growing up, I didn't think that's what I wanted to do. And I'm not sure how many folks in the room thought that was what they were going to do necessarily for, uh, for, for their career. I actually went to law school. Uh, with the idea of becoming a civil rights attorney, uh, of becoming a, a, a litigator. That was what I thought I could contribute in terms of 
change and, 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 and social justice. In my first year of law school, I, I took a negotiation class. And I, at that time, as a fairly you know, young person, I thought negotiation meant how to make the other person give what you want. <laughs> that, that, that was what the negotiation meant to me, uh, it was how to, how to beat up the other side. So I, I took the class with that idea. And I was shocked uh, that my teachers in this class, uh, they were Roger Fisher and Bruce Patton, uh, who's, who I think most of you know were, were two of the co-authors uh, of Getting to Yes. And the class was very bizarre to me. They, they were the two of the few professors who said, call me by my first name. And it wasn't by the Socratic method, right? It, was, it wasn't, which was, I, I will say, it was very intimidating at the time, right? To stand up in front of hundreds of people and recite the facts of a case and, uh, and, and give your argument there. And it, it really struck me. So I, I, uh, I enjoyed the class. I, I just remember like, oh, you know, you, you can understand the interests of both sides and you can come up with creative options. And, and so I, that was great. And so I, I went, but then after the class, I, I went on. Um, in, in my third year, in order to avoid taking a, another class in the winter term, we had a, a January workshop, the January time period, I, I, decided like oh I could I could be a teaching fellow and make pretty good money for for being a teaching fellow class and I was able to become a teaching fellow for for Roger and for Bruce and a couple of things I loved it I just loved the idea of it, it gave me a voice in the room that I hadn't expected uh, to, to have to to facilitate others to bring out uh, voices even in the classroom setting um, and I just, uh, I just really enjoyed it. And at the time, this, this will date me, but we had folks who were participants in the workshop who were from South Africa, who were, who were members of the African National Congress. And, and they were there because the South African, then all white South African government and the African National Congress had engaged uh, the negotiate Harvard negotiation project to help them with their constitutional negotiations post apartheid. And that was just amazing to me that that these tools could be used to to accomplish something that at the time I think people thought was not going to happen that that you could end apartheid peacefully and that and that government could voluntarily do this uh, under you know when Mandela and Bishop Tutu and the change that could be. And that changed my entire career. I, I, I realized that this was something I enjoyed doing. I was able to, to, to do that work and it led to a whole career. Now I wanna jump ahead a little bit and, and talk a bit about the work at CRS and the Community Relations Service uh, here. It was, uh, it was a time that really I, I was I felt very privileged to to work with people like Linda and Matthew and, and Charles uh, and Mildred, who who are who are here today and who are part of C CRS. I did not know that much about CRS. Uh, we we had I had worked. Uh, with colleagues who actually provide some training to, to CRS in in the mid 1990s, and when I had the opportunity to join the administration, the Obama administration, that was the one job that I thought I really, really wanted to do. That this was a, a place where mediation and conflict resolution skills could be applied. To the challenges of of race uh, in America, and so that was what really excited me uh, in doing so. And one of the and I so I tried to find out uh, what I could about about CRS. And the the one book that I found was a book called. Um, it was CR. It was about CRS. It was written by a man named Bertram Levine, who had been the associate director of of CRS and had spent his career from the 1960s 
to the 1990s in CRS. And, and I was, I was amazed at, at what, what uh, CRS had been doing uh, since the 1960s. It stopped uh, in, in 1989, uh, where, where the book stopped, uh, like 25 years of its, of its history. But it really was a guide to me personally when, when I was its uh, director. I understood the work even better once I became director. And after I left CRS, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. Um, this was in 2016 when, when, I, when I departed uh, from, from CRS. And I, you know, I saw what was happening with the country. I saw the, the, the change in the administration. I saw that uh, there was an attack upon CRS uh, at, at the time and, it, and, a, and, a, and a concerted effort to, to defund it. And I realized, well, what uh, I want to do something. And I picked up and I talked, uh, Bertram Levine had passed away at that time, uh, but his two children, Neil and, and David, I, I spoke with them. And they encouraged me that if I wanted to pick up uh, and write the next 25 years of history, that uh, that I would do so. And I want to do it to, to really honor the folks who've been doing this work without publicity, often anonymously, who had made a difference in the country. And and that's what uh, ultimately it, it, it took a long time, uh, but I, I, we ulti I ultimately was able to produce a second edition of it. And, you know, I, it, to the extent that I've been able to share the good work of, of people at CRS, then I feel like it's been been worth the time. Um, this was a, a, this was a picture after I, I, I had left CRS. But I, I, again, this was about the staff. I think you'll see some of the, your, some familiar faces there uh, as, as well. Uh, but these are the folks uh, who who've been doing the work and and I think it's important. Uh, I want to put them at the center of this. You know, people uh, like many in this room, uh, many in the audience today, being a, a mediator, being a facilitator, being an arbitrator uh, means raising other voices or bringing other voices to the table. And it's often about being. You know, if your work is done well, you're you're backstage, right? You're 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 not in the forefront here. Um, and and yet, I think those are the people who I think deserve uh, to to be applauded and affirmed, and 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 that's uh, what you know. I was really happy to do in this case. Um, I mentioned earlier to the folks when I, when we did our we did a check tech, technology check at. 8 a.m. at no at 7:45 a.m. Eastern time at 4:45 my time, um, and uh, I was barely awake at that point. But I am I I got a cup of coffee, so I'm doing a little better now. I, I shared that I don't like putting pictures of myself uh, into the presentation. This is the first time I think I've put them this this up front. But you know this is from the Judiciary Committee meeting when I was uh, nominated by President Obama and just like Supreme Court justices or federal judges do, they, they go in front of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, you know, what I would say is I was freaked out by the, op, the, 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 the idea of doing this, of, of not knowing what would happen uh, in, in that situation. And what I would say, I think, is that it's become, you know, things that go on. We talk about polarization in this country. I very distinctly remember I was on the on the panel that day with three other federal judge nominees, and it was not a pretty. It was a very polarized, challenging time. Less for me, and honestly, for for some of the other uh, judicial nominees. Uh, because it was a part, it was a very part, it was, it got very partisan and uh, there was, you know, quite a bit going on. It, it, you know, what, what I would say is, I think to the benefit of a new director has been nominated and confirmed to CRS. There was no, no one nominated or confirmed during the, the Trump administration. 
Uh, Paul Montero, who had been the acting director, uh, was nominated and confirmed both of us by unanimous consent. I think that says something uh, positive that for CRS, for the Community Relations Service, it hasn't been uh, so polarized and, and negative. And I think that's important as we think about the credibility of our civic institutions. Um, we, we know that things break down uh, for governments when it becomes, when civic institutions lack credibility, uh, important institutions, whether they be the, uh, you know, the, ch ch the churches, whether it be uh, civic organizations, law enforcement and others, how important it is. Um, I had the great fortune to work for Attorney General Eric Holder. And uh, you know, I, I share this picture, that's my wife next to me. A lot of the work for everyone you know, is, is challenging, but it's also challenging for the families and the sacrifices they have to make. And that's something I, you know, I take into account. It was not, you know, for, 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 for significant others and, and, and for children. Um, when I started, uh, I started August 1st, 2012. Uh, on August 5th, 2012, there was a shooting at a, at a temple or a Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, uh, where a, 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 a white supremacist uh, went in and, and shot to death a number of congregants there. On that day, I, I learned about it because I was boarding an airplane to, to Dallas, Texas to meet my CRS colleagues for the first time. And I saw this on the monitor as I was going on CNN as I was at S San Francisco headed to the, the airport. And uh, I, I learned very quickly uh, the importance and the abilities and skills of CRS staff, uh, many who had been working uh, with Sikh civil rights organizations, uh, Arab American civil rights organizations, Muslim organizations, in, in terms of uh, violence, uh, violence against uh, folks. Um, a lot of it, of course, uh, from from what happened on on 9/11 and some of the backlash that happened uh, in that. Uh, CRS had been working with, with with Sikh groups in in helping understand uh, the the religion, uh, which certainly um, is a very different religion than say the, the, the Muslim religion. And CRS um, was very involved from the very beginning uh, in having people on site, in helping to facilitate communication uh, between families uh, and in running a town hall in, in Oak Creek uh, I, along with uh, Harpreet Mocha, uh, we uh, briefed the First Lady um, at, at the time, uh, Michelle Obama, on her visit uh, to making sure that it was culturally sensitive. Uh, what you see here was from September of 2012, uh, where Harpreet Singh Saini testified uh, to a committee headed by Senator Dick Durbin on the inclusion and, and the accounting of for on hate crimes. Uh, and at that time, the Sikh religion was not counted uh, in, in terms of the reporting of hate crimes. And I, I was in the room uh, with, uh, with Harpreet on that day. Uh, you can see his brother behind him there. And they were trying to take an incredible tragedy and trying to make some meaning or uh, from it, and and in terms of having that counted, one thing that we worked on, the CRS worked on, Civil Rights Division worked on with the FBI was a changing. And um, in James Comey, who was the FBI uh, director, uh, this was something that went into effect and made a difference. And it you know it it, it is about the work that CRS can do in working with in tragedy 
and in working to improve things uh, with, for others. Um, this is a quote from civil rights pioneer and Congressman John Lewis. I, this was, I, I believe he said this at the 45th anniversary of CRS. Uh, as, as you all know, uh, John Lewis was the moral consciousness of this country and it's often talked about getting into good trouble. Uh, you know, there's so many, you know, it was so many amazing things about what he, what he stood for and, and how he, you know, did so much for this country by standing up to what was wrong, by calling it out. And he recognized that the, the importance of, of, of bringing peace where violence could have ruled the day. And, 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 I, and I share that because I, I it is a quote that's actually I added to the beginning of the second edition. And I think an important thing as we think about, you know, what is the role of, of conflict resolution in civil rights and in community and community conflicts? This is the uh, original uh, book by Bertram Levine, covered from the 1964 to 1989. Uh, by the way, I do want to say uh, for folks, I welcome um, questions as we go along. I'll probably speak for you know a little less, I would say about 30 more minutes, and then open up for, for the remainder, remainder of the time uh, for, for questions. Uh, but I welcome them. And if uh, so feel free to use, use the uh, raise your hand button uh, as, as, as well. Uh, and I, I, know, I think folks are, not, are going to we'll, we'll have a conversation about it. But I, but I do welcome that uh, as we go, go along uh, as, as well. Uh, that that's Bertram Levine, uh, and and again he he served in CRS uh, with with distinction and, and played almost uh, many many different roles uh, in in his time there, and, and I think it goes to the importance of capturing the history of the organization. Uh, earlier, you all talked about interviews uh, of folks. Um, another source that was extraordinarily helpful was by Heidi and Guy Burgess, who I think some of you may be f familiar with. They did an oral history project where they interviewed many CRS um, conciliators. And that was very useful just to, for, for me to understand the work before I came to it uh, and, and, and to, to figure out what the role is, especially when you're working in confidentiality and when you're not seeking publicity uh, for, for, for the work. Uh, uh, the Ohio State, where I, where I worked a bit with the Divided Community Project, and Bill Froelich, who's the deputy director there, he and Heidi have actually gone out and interviewed another, I believe, 10 uh, CRS uh, folks, uh, CRS meters. Uh, Renato Rivera ha had, had been interviewed and, uh, and, and many others. And I think that's important uh, for, for this kind of work uh, in, in terms of learning from the work and making it a part of the record in what, what, what we do. I, I'm going to share just a little bit um, uh, of the history. I, th I think so many of you know it. Uh, some of you, I, I will say that I, it, is still, it still strikes a chord in me as we are as we are in the midst of thinking about issues like the like voting rights, uh, which is up in front of the Supreme Court, as as we think of issues like affirmative action that uh, that will be coming in front of the Supreme Court this year, um, and the times that that we are facing today, this was a a picture from 1963 uh, from Birmingham after Bull Connor, who was a public safety commissioner. Uh, Un unleashed uh, dogs upon the protesters uh, in, in a situation uh, where basically the African American community uh, was boycotting and uh, voicing protest uh, against uh, segregation in, in Birmingham. Uh, it is, uh, I think, sometimes an under told story about Black empowerment uh, about the ability they basically ended uh, segregation uh, in Birmingham at that time uh, 
And Burke Marshall, who was the civil rights attorney, really mediated that situation. And this was one of the situations that led to the creation of CRS. Uh, he, it took a lot to mediate this. Clarence Jones, who, who, who runs, who is um, Martin Luther King's attorney, uh, was involved in the negotiation of, of this. It tells incredible stories of, of, of going with Rockefeller to uh, going to a bank in New York to getting the money to bail out uh, Martin Luther King, uh, for, for example, who was in the Birmingham jail and writes that incredible letter from the Birmingham jail, which again changes the, the trajectory of the civil rights movement uh, as, as, as well. Uh, but Burke Marshall said, you know, he was, he was that doing this type of mediation was just too time consuming, that he had lots of litigation to do, as we all know, uh, during during this during the 1960s and felt that there was a use for another agency uh lbj uh lyndon baines johnson was really the person who but for him the crs would not have been created he had proposed it earlier uh, arthur goldberg who's a supreme court justice uh, wrote the legis original legis legislation to, to create it uh, and and it is in title 10 of the 1964 civil rights act arguably the most important legislation. I, you can also argue along with that, the 1965 Voting Rights Act and 1965 uh, Immigration uh, Act uh, as well has changing, really changing America uh, in, in the 20th century and, and, if, and in, impacts us uh, t today. Uh, interestingly enough, when, when after this was signed, when LBJ talked about it, there was huge concern about um, what would happen uh, as we were trying to desegregate in, in the South. And really only talked about CRS that day because they were trying to really focus on trying to prevent violence uh, out out in uh, America over over that July 4th, uh, excuse me, in July of 1964. The uh, the first major conflict that CRS was engaged in uh, was after Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965. That's John Lewis, uh, who who was then a leader of the Student Nonviolent uh, Committee uh, of, of SNCC. Uh, and, and this is uh, from that day where there was violence and, and where John Lewis gets his skull fractured uh, there. Lyndon Baines Johnson is outraged, the country is outraged and sends CRS to, uh, to, Sel to Selma uh, in order to, to stop the violence. And and that's uh, that's Andrew Young, who is uh, who's John Lewis is on on the left, and Andrew Young is is the person uh, cl closest to the camera angle here. And this is much of what the the second there's a second and third march, and CRS was very engaged in making sure uh, that the protesters would not be injured, would not be harmed and spoke with various parties. For those who are familiar with it or seen the movie Selma, uh, there is what happens at the Pettus Bridge and the fear uh, when, when the group crosses and where Martin Luther King stops uh, in the middle of the bridge and, and they begin to, 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 to sing and then they turn back. That was, it was uh, largely due to CRS that there was not violence. Um, uh, Leroy Collins, who's the in, in the in the picture, uh, was the director. He had been the governor of of Florida, and talked about that that there was tears that flowed, but not but not blood on on that day. Um, this is a photo of uh, LBJ. Uh, Lynn Bay Johnson is Roger Wilkins, who was who who was the second director of CRS. Uh, Roy Wilkins, uh, who was the secretary of NAACP. Uh, Roger Wilkins was the highest ranked uh, African-American official in, in the Lyndon Baines Johnson administration. He was very focused on issues of poverty, uh, issues of underlying symptoms. He was actually wary of mediation. He felt it was um, that it wasn't going to change some of the underlying issues and, and really at CRS focused in a in a way that I think is there are echoes today as, as we think about anti-racism, as we think about oppressive systems, uh, of how to think of it from a systems perspective. And, and, and he played a, a, key, a key role in, in that. Um, 
a, a note that uh, LBJ and the and the Attorney General at the time, Robert Kennedy, as you may, may remember, they did not get along at all, um, and they were often very petty with each other. LBJ wanted to make sure uh, that uh, that uh, the, that Roger Wilkins. Um, uh, was not uh, going to be. I think uh, that he, he would be that he would be there, and, and that RFK uh, w w was not going to be. But there was. It was always. It was. A, if you looked at some of the history. It's actually pretty, pretty fascinating as as well. Um, this is uh, Dick Salem, uh, who was a CRS conciliator and early pioneer of. Uh, ACR and and other um, other dispute resolution organizations. Uh, he he worked at the in Wounded Knee at, at, at mediating there, and he also worked at Skokie, uh, Illinois. And I'm going to share a picture uh, of uh, of that of that conflict uh, where he was mediating. He was mediating with Nazis in that case, and there are certainly echoes as we think about Charlottesville. Uh, re more recently. This is uh, Frank Collin, uh, who was an American Nazi leader in, in Chicago. And he, for, for those who are uh, who, who went to law school, this is a famous case that basically stands for the First Amendment rights uh, of, of free speech, no matter how odious uh, the, the speech, speech may be. What I think is sometimes lost in history is that there could have been terrific violence uh, in this because he was the, uh, the the American Nazi group in Chicago and we forget Nazis were performing terrorist acts uh, in in the 1970s there were there were some horrible acts of tragedy there uh, he was he wanted to protest originally in Chicago it's uh, it then goes to Skokie where it had the largest constant uh, largest percentage and largest number of Holocaust survivors here. Uh, he uh, he wanted to make this happen there uh, in order to make a splash. People refused to negotiate with him. People were threatening his life. People were threatening to come uh, to Skokie if the protests happened. Uh, David Greenberger, who was the ACLU attorney, uh, who was Jewish, who was defending Frank Collin and, and his First Amendment right? Uh, thought that it was thought that it was going to be there was going to be violence, and he actually does credit Dick Salem uh, in mediating and in preventing bloodshed uh, in that in that situation. Uh, this, this is Wallace Warfield, who I think many many of you uh, know, and who was a I think a, a true pioneer in conflict resolution and 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 civil rights. Um, I, if there's a terrific book uh, that that ca gathers his work uh, from conflict resolution to social justice that captures many of his his writings. He was very um, when I thought about the theory and I was trying to weave how how, how do we think about civil rights and um, conflict resolution, his voice was often in my head as, I, as, I, as I, I wrote. And I would think about how he talked about how you can run along a conflict and you, you're never quite sure when the moment is that you, your skills and your expertise will, will make a difference. Uh, and he also, you know, he, he, uh, he also talked about you know what is the purpose of conflict resolution in these conflicts is it to release the pressure is it is it it is, is it and his his thought that has always remained with me is that it's not about maintaining the status quo what is happening what what change does it bring uh, to the situation here this is silka hansen um who who's one of one of my heroes who this is on i got to meet her when she visited crs uh, dur during my time there, and she was sharing her stories uh, with, with us. Uh, she was uh, integral in a number of mediations, including uh, after the Los Angeles police, uh, you know, in terms of what they did and, and with Rodney King, in terms of what led to to the, the protests there. And, and she mediated with Korean Americans um, uh, who had suffered incredible losses. Uh, about a, 
more than a billion dollars of damage to their business and she was mediating on on money that was coming in and how it would would go to the go to the Korean American communities here. Uh, she was also very uh, an important mediator at the Boston Public Schools, uh, as, as we remember in desegregation in the, in the 1970s, um, and, and played a role and, and was often in danger. I, this was very striking for those who who worked uh, in CRS in the 60s, 70s, uh, especially whose lives were often um, in danger. She was uh, she was placed second on like a, a wanted list uh, next to Judge Arthur Garrity, who was, who, was the, who was a judge involved there. I think one important piece of the story, and this is true both in, in law enforcement and community, uh, you know, in, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the violence uh, and in the mistreatment of black and brown individuals by, by law enforcement, and also in school desegregation, uh, school districts across the country did not want to be another Boston because of what, what happened uh, in, in Boston. And CRS worked with school districts across the country in learning the lessons and how to in how to make uh, how to make the school, school segregation was going to be difficult no matter what public school desegregation, uh, but to doing so in a way that uh, in preparation and in in working with the communities and working with the parents and working with the students and to doing so in a nonviolent way. And I, very much, I think, uh, uh, to the credit of those at, at CRS. Uh, this is um, a picture of, of the CRS folks who, who worked on the black church burnings in the 1990s. And there was a whole team of, of CRS folks um, Janet Reno, you may, may, may recognize her, who's the Attorney General there. Uh, Rose Ochi uh, was the first Asian American to be the director of CRS, who, who, had, um, who had been uh, at the camps at Manzanar, Japanese American internment camps. And she was, a, I think, a, a really important and groundbreaking pioneer as, as, as director then. Um, and and the, the important you know, work that, that was done there. Uh, this is Ron Wakabayashi, uh, who worked out of LA, uh, uh, who, who recently re re retired uh, from, from CRS. And he had been the exec national director of the Japanese American Citizens League uh, during uh, reparations, uh, a, a topic that is, you know, has certainly come back as we think about uh, for, for African Americans in, in the movement that it, is going on today. And, with uh, the Elaine Gonzalez case, which I'll say, uh, share a, a little bit uh, more about uh, as well, and was a, was a key figure in working at Sanford after Trayvon Martin, uh, uh, you know, along with Mildred, who, who's, who's on the call today as, as well. Um, he's also re now retired, um, and, uh, and actually, I, I, I'm proud to say he's working with the Divided Community Project at Ohio State, and uh, still doing the work uh, in, in a different sort of way uh, today uh, as well. Uh, many of you re may recall this picture from uh, no uh, uh, from 2000. Uh, on November 21st, 1999, Elian Gonzalez was traveling uh, with his mother uh, from Cuba uh, to, to Miami. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the makeshift craft capsized and a fisherman uh, who's actually pictured here uh, found uh, Elian uh, there. And what transpired, uh, you know, really transfixed the nation at, at the time and what was going on uh, in Miami with the Cuban American community and, and, the and the desire of the family in Miami, Elian's relatives in Miami who want to keep him there uh, versus his father in Cuba who wanted to, to bring him back. Uh, I was, it's a chapter uh, that's fairly unknown about the, what the mediation efforts uh, were there. Thomas Battles um, was was a, played a, a key figure there, and almost almost worked with Janet Reno uh, to 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 have this 
and peacefully without uh, what eventually what eventually did did happen. There were a couple. There were a number of efforts uh, in doing so. Uh, but regardless, worked worked with the Cuban community, worked with the African American community to uh, to 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 maintain as peaceful as possible uh, the protests that that did happen there. I don't want to break yes. your flow, but we had two a couple of oh, questions please. from the audience that I just wanted to give voice to. Um, uh, one of them was uh, from Judge Walter Rivera, who asked if you could comment on the failed negotiation during the Attica uprising in New York. And then another one came in that might be tied to, to your commentary, who, um, where Diane asks, who determines which cases CRS mm -hmm. would be involved in and what criteria did they determine or yeah. did they use? And, and were citizens able to, to seek out CRS help directly? Yeah. Um, CRS did, uh, let me take the first question and I'll come back to the, to the second question. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I wasn't planning on speaking a lot of it here, but CRS did quite a bit of work uh, with prisons in this country and quite, um, they were often um, engaged by judges and special masters. This is before, you know, the Department of Justice has a, an Office of Dispute Resolution uh, before, uh, and really, uh, I think our pioneers, I, I appreciate the judge's question uh, on, on this in terms of um, in, in terms of working on the treatment and uh, of prisoners, sometimes deseg uh, segregation issues, uh, racial concerns, mistreatment, uh, and, and judges did engage CRS in a prior to court mediation really taking off before that was a thing right um and there's a whole uh, there is a chapter in the book there uh devoted to to that uh there's a actually a terrific documentary uh, on attica that, that 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 came out recently it talks about it clarence jones uh who was uh, was very engaged with that and plays actually a central a central role in that uh as as well so i, I appreciate um, appreciate raising that. Can you repeat the second question again? Absolutely. Yeah. The second question was who determined which cases CRS yeah. would get involved with and what criteria were used and were citizens able to directly request yeah. CRS's help? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, thank you, Nikki. Uh, so, you know, per Title 10 of the 1964 Civil, Civil Rights Act, any party can actually request right. it. Right, so a party can can request it. It can come from a citizen, and uh, to that, uh, and it's based on you know it has to meet the jurisdictional requirements of of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which had to do with race or national origin. Right, so for for most of its existence, it had to do with race or national origin. Um, in 2009, because of the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, that's where CRS's jurisdiction is expanded really uh, for for the first time. So it can go beyond race, it can go and ethnicity, and and can go to gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, or disability. So that uh, so that jurisdiction is, is, is opened up. And, and for those of you, very familiar, you know, who've worked in federal government or state government or local government know the importance of making sure that you stay within the lanes that uh, that have been created for you. Um, the regional, I think the regional directors play a, a, certainly a, a, a role in in setting, uh, you know, what cases to take. Um, and it, and it, it, the challenge is uh, the number of, of conciliators per region, right? Of, of what of what one can can do here. Um, the conciliator, I think, uh, has a role, and the and so that's how the determination was made. And again, you know that that can vary upon uh, administration as to what the what the policies and and standards are that that you utilize, but. Uh, important to recognize that it's a voluntary. This is not prosecutional. This is this is not investigatory, right? Uh, it is like like many of you uh, folks who are practitioners, mediation practitioners here, it is entered into entered into volunt voluntarily. Okay, so so thank you for this question. I appreciate appreciate that. And uh, I want to get to a few more, and then just open up and, and do. I I actually uh, would would love to hear more questions and just be engaged uh, in that. And I certainly welcome uh, CRS folks that, uh, and, and others to jump in here. Um, so this is a, 
as we know, Tray Trayvon Martin, uh, this act actually happened fair. The tragedy ha unfolded fairly early in, in my tenure uh, at, at CRS. And, you know, Mildred, who's, who's on the call, uh, played a huge role uh, and an important role, uh, along with Thomas Battles, along with, with, with many others, uh, in terms of, of what happened there, you know, if we go back in, in history, this you know this played out differently than what today. This, you know, again, cell phones, technology, as as was mentioned earlier by Linda, it changes the work too, right? Because all of a sudden, we all have high def of uh, high def cameras and video cameras, uh, millions of them, right, in in this country, and so much more is captured and and share a shock. And you know, I shared the photo from B Birmingham. Each generation has a new technology. It changes the work. It, it changes what is seen. Uh, in the past, there would be, it would be the, it might be, right, the law enforcement's word against a person who may not uh, be alive or, or, or it might be against their word. So smartphones change much. Technology changes much. Social media changes. Uh, how the how how the work is done, and and we were starting to we we certainly saw that in in 2012, uh, the CRS conciliators there play a, a huge role in in working with the community in working with the city manager uh, Norton Bonaparte, uh, Andrew Thomas, who would who who some of you may know he ran a a dispute resolution center in Rochester, New York, had moved to Sanford and had been within the city government. It really does change um, how this unfolds. And the power of mediation, I think, in, in, in allowing First Amendment rights to, to, to be practiced in terms of, uh, of working, you know, rather than against uh, protesters here. There were many protests. There, it was this, as you remember, this was much, very much about the stand your ground law uh, in, in Florida, where it was the fir first, uh, where it extends the, you know, the, the self-defense uh, right uh, for, further here. And, and the, the, the then mayor of, of, uh, of Sanford very much credited CRS with, with keeping their city safe and keeping it from exploding further. Uh, the, the CRS worked and, and engaged with the city government, but also then, this is prior, by, by the way, this is prior to Black Lives Matter forming, but then at that point it was National Action Network with Al Sharpton, it was Jesse Jackson um, in, in, do, in doing so. Um, Black Lives Matter does get created, of course, after the, after the not guilty ver verdict of George Zimmerman uh, in 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 that case. Oops, let me see here. Um, the situation that certainly uh, CRS was engaged in during my tenure was in Ferguson as well. Um, a number of CRS conciliators, some of who are in this call, were very engaged at at Ferguson. Uh, in Baltimore after the Freddie Gray tragedy as, as well. Each, each has its own context. I, I, I can go into it more into each situation. I think CRS played a, an important role uh, in Ferguson. As remember, uh, I remember being on the ground with a few, some of my colleagues and, and the fires that were happening and, and the looting that was happening. It was, um, a crisis, uh, I think, for this country, certainly at this time, I think it's fair to say the it was a hard uh, Attorney General Holder shared with me that it was his hardest decision of whether to actually come to Ferguson, right? If he had come and things turned out worse, the administration would be blamed. Uh, it was, I remember Eric Holder, I mean, it was as Attorney General, he and as a black man, he was often targeted and focused in, in, in social media and, and, and misinformation ca campaigns as a as a proxy uh, for for our first black president uh, in, in that situation. But he made the decision to go and, and CRS was the first uh, agency on the scene um, in, in, in this in this situation. And and it was a couple of conciliators and who went right away after the, I remember that Saturday, I, you know, after Michael Brown 
uh, was shot and killed uh, and how difficult it be immediately began there and and Attorney General Holder making decision. We've worked very closely with him and his team in setting up what would happen uh, when he came in having a city hall, uh, which I moderated in meeting uh, with faith leaders. And I always remember being very, I remember being very concerned and anxious about what would happen that that day. And, and it was it was quite, you know, it, I felt very relieved, I think would be the word I would use about um, that that day was the first peaceful day after more than a dozen days of, of real difficult turmoil there. Uh, this was at, uh, in Ferguson, uh, when he was addressing a town hall and I, I very much remember him saying, you know, he's the attorney general, but he was also a black man. And he talked about being stopped by police in the New Jersey Turnpike and the fear that he had and the concern that he had. He mentioned that his brother was in law enforcement. And uh, I'll, I'll always remember what uh, Attorney General Holder did uh, that day and, and the work of many of my ICRS colleagues that day. Uh, I'm going to end with this picture. This is on the 50th anniversary. It was July 14, 2014. I remember it very well because it was also my 50th birthday. Uh, it was the 50th anniversary of CRS, and we were. It also turned out to be my 50th birthday, um, uh, as 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 well. But uh, uh, many of our, this this included many of our the current the people who were at CRS at the time and and folks who had been there before Andrew Young. Um, uh, was there with us? It was to me an important day to mark, uh, to to mark the uh, the contributions of CRS. Matthew, I believe, is on that top left here, uh, 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 on that side there, and that that's in the Great Hall of the Department of Justice. So I am going to stop it here. I'm um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to share about CRS. I um, and it's and its work. Let me stop the, stop the share here. I encourage you to um, if to read more about CRS, uh, the America's Peacemakers. Uh, there's an audible version uh, as, as well, if, if you would like to, to listen to it. It's a, a, it's, it covers, uh, there's so many things I did not cover today and so many amazing things that, that did happen. Um, but uh, again, uh, thank you, thank you for your time. I I'm happy to share. You know, I'm happy to take a few questions, and I, I may, I may come in with a little bit more about what I've done since CRS, which is working with the Divided Community Project, which works on issues of polarization out of the Ohio State. Um, Thomas Battles and Ron Wakabayashi uh, both do work with them now, but it's been working on all issues of polarization, uh, including uh, racial, including political, and has been doing good work. Uh, around around that and uh, more recently i've been working with the rebuild congress initiative and working with the issues of uh, with our uh, congressional leaders and our civic leaders across the political spectrum uh, using the same tools uh, and, and trying to facilitate uh, bring consensus uh, in in challenging situations as as as, as well so if with that, I would love to have love to be in dialogue uh, with our remaining time here with folks. So I so welcome there, any questions or comments. There's a couple of uh, of individuals who have posted questions in the chat. I want to open up the opportunity for for you to to raise them in your own voice if you would if you would prefer. Um, and and if not, as people kind of clear their throats, I can I can certainly jump in. You actually already addressed uh, one of the questions, which is what are you doing now? Mm -hmm. um, um, but let's start with a question um, mm. about how a how does a community get engaged with CRS? Mm -hmm. There uh, and we have uh, you know certainly a bunch of CRS folks here on the on the line, but there are field offices throughout the country. Um, there are uh, you know, regional offices throughout the country, uh, and you can certainly go to the Community Relations Service uh, website uh, within the Department of Justice for their phone numbers and 
uh, that you can reach folks, uh, reach out to folks. I encourage it. I think the the, the power of CRS is the, are the relationships uh, that that they have in the communities themselves, right? That they they are that they work with people, civil rights groups, faith leaders, um, uh, law enforcement, nonprofits uh, in there. So yeah, I would absolutely encourage folks in their communities to, to reach out to the regional offices or field offices just to get to know uh, your your CRS conciliators and regional directors uh, out out there in, in the field. Um, you know, I mentioned faith leaders, an important part, and I, I'm doing work with black faith leaders today that, I, that I'd love to share a little bit more about how important uh, faith leaders are in in helping create better dialogue and in, in helping to create trust uh, in, in Sanford, for example, in, in, in the work that uh, you know Mildred uh, and, and Thomas did in bringing together black and white faith leaders, it was really a really important part, I think, for, for the Sanford community to have them talking, to have them working with their congregations uh, in, in, and in building closer relationships that, that, that maintain to, to this to this day, and I know, you know, I think, you know, uh, Linda talked about technology uh, in Sanford, and, and Mildred reminded me of this: is that they monitored social media, and, and that was, you know, that was an important, and doing that was important. We did that in Ferguson as well. That it became a part of the work that you had to you had to do that in order to understand you you have to in the old days right it was sitting at your desk and reading the newspaper and the headlines to figure out what was going on in the communities um but I'm, i appreciate that a number of folks are asking about how to reach out and i you know it, it is by calling the office or emailing them and 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 asking i mean they do work around mediation training facilitation convening uh, the, the, they bring the skills. I also encourage uh, CRS under Paul Montero. They're, they're doing a lot of hiring. Um, the, the truth of the matter was during the Trump administration, more than 50% of the staff departed for one reason or the other. Uh, there is the opportunity right now to, to, to add to its ranks. So uh, if you know if folks are interested in doing the work, I would encourage them to, 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 to look at it and to look at the main positions. And the difference now versus the time that I was a director is that people can work remotely. Uh, that was not the case <laughs> back when I was a, a director of CRS. That's changed. A lot has changed. So uh, it, I think it's a good time to look, to look at that as well. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna hop to another question. Yes. And if anybody wants to raise their hand, uh, either you can pop on with your video and raise your actual hand, and we'll try to see you. Although there's several pages of you. Um, uh, and if not, you can raise your virtual hand. But uh, the next question is from Verlin uh, Francis, who comes from Canada. Lovely to see you virtually. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to know what kind of work does CRS do in conflict prevention, and mm -hmm. especially in what appears to be an escalation of violence against minority groups. Mm -hmm. You've touched on a little bit, but if yeah, you could expand yeah. on that. And, I, and again, uh, I may not, I've, I've not been at CRS uh, for 10 years now. So um, I think it's going to be more important to, you know, to, to, to look directly. Uh, Nodra has put the, the CRS website uh, on, on the chat. So that I think is a great resource. Um, you know, very recently, President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, did a, a United We Stand summit at the White House that CRS wa was engaged uh, in, and uh, and so there has there there are a number of efforts on the prevention of hate crimes. A lot of prevention work is in training, right? Uh, the different types of training that, that CRS does, and I know they've gone through a whole a lot of work. Uh, in terms of enhancing and adding to the different types of training, whether it's working at schools, uh, whether it's working on different uh, cultural competency or cultural professional issues, uh, like working uh, with, with different religions, the, the, the Sikh religion, the Muslim religion, uh, and others as well. I, um, by the way, I also see that Matthew has put his uh, email address uh, as a CRS conciliator. So there's a, you have another contact point uh, as as well to 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 reach out to, to CRS uh, as 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 well here. Mm -hmm. 
That's excellent. And we will, we will follow up um, when mm -hmm. we post the recording. Uh, I always include the resources that we've kind mm -hmm. of gathered in the chat, uh, along with all of these uh, um, brave souls who've put their personal uh, contact information <laughs> in the in the feed. Um, there's a question I wanted to hear more about the, the work that you've do been doing with the anti-polarization and mm -hmm. rebuild Congress projects, if you'd like mm -hmm. to sure. develop that. Sure. Um, so uh, with the with the rebuild Congress initiative, it was started, and I'll 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 post their website as 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 well. Um, is that Congress has an important role to play within our governmental structure, right? We we have the courts, right? The we have the that we have the legislative and we have the executive branch here. As most of us know, Congress has not fulfilled its legislative responsibility, its governance responsibility here. And uh, about four years ago, a couple of colleagues who are now uh, my people I work with, but uh, Bruce Patton, uh, who I mentioned earlier, along with J.B. Lyons started uh, the Rebuild Congress Initiative, they re initially reached out to 60 co congressional representatives and at, just used the tools and, and asked lots of questions about what is working, what is not working, what would they like to see in Congress. Uh, and it helped set up, it helped launch the House Select Committee on Modernization. We've certainly seen the House Select Committee on the January 6th, for example. Uh, for, for the last four years, we've had the House Select Committee on Modernization. You can look at their work, and they've done they've they put forward like 120 proposals to improve Congress, and and they, they had to calling it modernization works right because who's who's against modernization? It might be different to call it bipartisanship. That's not so easy these days uh, to work uh, no, uh, to be identified in that in that way. But it's done a lot of work in terms of. Uh, the HR function in terms of diversity, in terms of of getting common briefing, uh, you know, between between the different parties. Thirty have been fully implemented, so it's they've got, done some good work. They've done even a, even an idea like um, having a separate room off of the House floor where people can talk to each other privately is a good thing. Transparency is a wonderful thing. Accountability. That's you know, we, we, there's increased trans uh, increased um, transparency, but there is the benefit of just having a conversation and not have that be on C-SPAN. Uh, that that because certain congressional members, it becomes problematic to be even seen to be even seen with someone from from the the other other party here. Um, so you know we've been we we've been bringing together people across the political spectrum. Uh, and this includes some some basically leaders of of in, of institutions across the political spectrum to discuss issues like social media polarization. You know, that's a big big issue that is really exacerbating the country's divides. Right when you have an industry uh, where it's a growth conflict, is what they are it grows faster. We we know that lies travel six times faster than the truth on the internet right we know that what's stickier for these uh, social media companies uh, is anger and adversarialism right then rather than collaboration and and connection here uh, so uh, by there's something called section 230 of the community decency act uh, which reg which has in some ways given a pass to social media companies in what they do. Should we, how, how, how do we need to think about um, social media going going forward? Uh, there's we are we are also working on issues of election integrity. You know that is a fundamental issue for this country uh, in the, the coming midterms and the coming presidential election uh, on how to how to think about that. Uh, I'm I'm actually personally leading a, a work with um, black ministers right now, uh, black faith leaders. Uh, who play such an important role in democracy? You know, there's a, there's a whole field of, of people who, who are concerned about, you know, are we slipping into uh, authoritarianism? Are there's a concern about these things? Um, the work that 
black faith leaders have done, you know, we talked a little bit about it at the beginning in the 1960s, right, the, the Voting Rights Act, Selma leads to the Voting Rights Act, and, and, and those issues are still very strongly within uh, for us, for us today. Uh, faith leaders have been working on the issue of voting rights, have been working on the issue, uh, the fundamental issues, and and have helped in places like Sanford in, in bringing peace to our communities and helped in, in Baltimore. We, we worked very closely with black faith leaders, um, making sure that they're engaged in the issues like social media polarization, in, in, in issues of election integrity, in spaces that have been traditionally white in terms of who's been working on them uh, and making sure that voices are brought to the table uh, is an important, an important thing. Um, so it's, it's, and it's very much using the tools of gathering people and in, in, in bringing creative thinking and building trust and bringing together people who may not normally talk to each other, who, who can actually create a difference. And that's, you know, I'm very, I, I was called, you know, like, my, like many of you, I'm called to, we are called to this work at a time uh, when it's needed, uh, when this country I think is, is in need. I, I, see in, I see in the chat about Braver Angels. I don't know whether CRS is engaged with it. I mean, Braver Angels is incredibly important and has been very successful, I think, in bringing together people on the left and, and, and the right um, in, in terms of having conversations. Uh, Stanford recently did a, uh, a, a challenge on how to, re how to reduce partisan, sh uh, partisan animosity uh, here and the good news is that the that there are many things you can do by bringing to people together by having storytelling by learning more from each other it it can act and think about how do we make that more scalable is important a little harder to do in terms of people taking anti-democratic actions that's a that's a challenge because people think the other side's doing it why can't we do it um uh, and, and that that's a bit of bit of a challenge here. It's not sufficient, right? Uh, what uh, what Braver Angels and other organizations like Braver Angels are doing, I would put in Search for Common Ground, which is doing I think ter terrific work, which is which has created a U.S. program uh, uh, as well. I think uh, you know Shamal Idris and Neilan Parker are doing really really important and good work. But it's seeing it's also seeing what the media landscape is. It's also thinking about how. The, the problem with social media, the problem with, with Congress is that the structure of them, you're rewarded for being adversarial. You are rewarded for attacking the other side. You get, you get more money. Uh, uh, you know, you can you can go directly to small donors. There's there's structural issues that we also have to look at that uh, that are, that I think are crucial here as as well. Uh, thank thank you so much. And you've actually pulled pulled kind of elements of some of the questions. I want to just throw the mic to uh, to Matthew Latimer, who is literally on the ground doing the good work of CRS now. So, but he's going to be joining us from a cafeteria just to to say a few words and to talk about some opportunities to find out more about CRS. Matthew, are you uh, able to to come live for a second, at least uh, audio? Sure. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Nikki. And I'm not sure if folks can hear me. Like I said, I'm, I'm literally <laughs> in a cafeteria right now. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank Grant for, for taking the time to come and share uh, with everyone this morning. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, uh, Linda, Mildred, Charles, Denise, uh, who are on the line as well. Uh, in terms of CRS, the, the website's been given out, which is www.justice.gov slash CRS. And one thing, if you do have a community group uh, that would like more information on CRS, we can actually come out and do outreach um, to give you more information on the agency and also to identify some issues and concerns and see if there are some uh, services that we can provide. And that is a little, that, to answer one of the questions that was in the chat, that is preventative. So if there are, are things that are percolating up to the surface that um, look like they could come to a boil, you know, that's, that's time to reach out to CRS and actually have us come in uh, to, you know, share resources to also identify some of our other um, federal and state partners who also may be able to, to come in and to help with that situation. And with that, I'll turn it back to, to Brad and Nikki. 
Thank, thank you, Matthew. Uh, again, I, I really appreciate Matthew's uh, invitation to, to, to come here. Uh, and uh, even though he's working from a cafeteria today, he's still, uh, he's still working uh, and, and doing this as well. So thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Uh, I, also, I just want to say I put my email uh, in the chat. I put the website for the Rebuild Congress initiative there. It is a project of the Harvard Negotiation Project in, in, in issue one. Um, and I also put the Divided Community Project at Ohio State, which is doing terrific work. I was very proud uh, to work with with them uh, for for two years, and and they're doing they're still doing terrific work uh, out there as well. Thank you. And I, and I wanted to just emphasize the, the great overlap of past speakers. So I encourage everybody to check out the websites that I put in the chat earlier and Maria did as well with some of the recordings of uh, Roundtable Breakfast speakers. And now Mildred from either Puerto Rico or somewhere else, I think, has a question uh, she would like to ask live. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Um, just, a, just a question. Um, reference to the title of the presentation. Uh, Larry put in the chat um, the interest that maybe as a community representative of the sort has on prevention. So how much is the lack of prevention leading to polarization? Can you kind of offer your perspectives about that? That's a great question, um, Mildred. Um... I, I would answer that as saying, in in any situation, right? M Matthew just mentioned how if something's boiling, uh, if you can get there before, if you can, um, that makes it makes a huge difference. It's it, you know, uh, it's it's really hard though, right? The, the, you, we don't know where it's going to 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 happen here. I know some folks who are working in this space are really working around the election because that's a repeatable, we know when the elections are gonna happen. What can we focus on to prevent violence there, right? Uh, is something that people are working on. Different different groups are working on that uh, there. How, back, how far back do we have to go to the causes of it, right? Uh, as, as well. Um, Cynthia Miller Idris, who's a professor at American University who works on white extremism issues, will, will talk about how if we're trying to re prevent extremism, you know, right wing extremism, working with veterans groups, like helping helping veterans return, get 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 jobs, right? How do you get to, to places early enough to do that kind of prevention work? How do we treat extremism um, as a public health issue, perhaps, uh, as a way of thinking about this. I'm, I'm going, I mean, so, so Mildred, your, your question opens up so much. I, I do think preparation is under-focused on in this, in this country. I mean, if we looked at a, a country like Germany, when they, when they faced uh, some white extremism problems in the, in the 90s, they they open centers kind of similar to alcoholics uh, you know recovery centers as a way of treating it more as a public health issue right um, there, the, Brian Stevenson uh, from the Equal Justice Initiative it, it has has focused on issues as a litigator on incarceration issues but he's also focused on how do we think about the the tragedies that have befallen us in the past and how do we how do we mark it right uh, he's the, the national civil rights memorial even think about you know i think about truth and reconciliation work <laughs> has a preventative measure uh, as as well that we have to acknowledge our past or honor our past uh understand our legacy in order to move for and with the purpose of moving forward and and so uh, it, the preparation question mildred is a terrific one because we have to think about it in so many ways. And, and how do we think about this as a society? I think we'll say a lot about where we go from here. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to give voice to a question from Marty Itzak, especially timely, uh, kind of coming off the, the high holidays. Yesterday was Yom mm -hmm. Kippur. Yeah. He wanted to know what's being done with anti-Semitism currently. Um, 
we know that you know there's been a rise in anti-Semitism in terms of the number of incidents, right? The uh, the ADL has ha, has noted that as well as uh, some of the hate crimes, the, the official hate crimes reporting, which we know is 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 under reporting. Um, ADL, I think, has been doing some really interesting things and made some interesting hires on on how to look look at uh, look at this look at these issues. Uh, certain states like California have been putting in more funding um, in looking at rate, uh, hate crimes in general in, in general uh, as as well. Uh, I do want to know. I I I think Larry Schooler was on the on the line. And he's been doing really good. I talked about truth and reconciliation uh, issues and. And, and Larry has been doing terrific work and, and, and continue to do that uh, on, on that issue uh, as, 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 as well. Um, so in terms, you know, the Department of Justice, I think the administration has been focused on hate crimes as a whole and, and certainly uh, on the increase in anti-Semitism. It is about, I think, what is the response when it's not our community, right? Who, who, who raises the issue? Who, who are the allies in the issue? I think matters tremendously in how we think about it. Uh, uh, you know, in the, in this time, certainly uh, there's been a lot of work on working on the the, the nationalist group who, who who have anti who often have anti-Semitic uh, found foundations. You know, whether it's uh, the Proud Boys or or, or the Oath Keepers uh, as well, and, and certainly um, you know I'll raise it here uh, the, the concern around anti Asian violence. There certainly has been an increase in that, uh, and and there's a lot of work by Stop AAPI Hate uh, and uh, and others on the issue uh, as well. Thank you. I, I realize we're asking you about all of the world's problems, so it's it's a it's a heavy <laughs> early morning uh, task. Um, Harvey Newman, uh, I wanted to give you the microphone next to, to unmute yourself. Yes, and thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Rickard. Um Yes, CRS. Uh, sounds, I, I came on late, unfortunately, today, but uh, I heard uh, much of what you said, and it was really very, very, uh, very um, informative. Uh, the question I always have that that comes up is in a country that has freedom of speech how mm -hmm. do we how do we balance that with the with the amount the huge amounts of money on both sides that, that is being expended uh, wastefully in my opinion uh, to, uh, to, to, to to get this freedom of speech uh, in this day and age um, how, how do we do that I, I know the founding fathers had no idea that, that anything right. <laughs> What's happening, <laughs> Harvey? That's a whole other presentation. I, I think you're asking for a whole other conversation. Well, um, then come I, back to that. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a it's a terrific. If if Harvey is the question, if the question around there's so much money and uh, that's being poured in by both sides, right? Citizens United, the Supreme Court case opened it up to huge amounts of money going going into this i would at least offer and, and we know the supreme court is 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 going a certain direction right there's a concern about what's going to happen this term and a lot of fundamental issues like voting rights and like affirmative action and all that i think it's important you know as a society and to how do we balance those issues here uh, of freedom of speech i yeah, I mean, I personally, you know, not speaking on behalf of any organization, we have to look, we have to really look hard at how, how money is is being used uh, in in our elections, right? You can look at different countries around the world who, who operate very differently. I, I'd also rec, you know, I think there's also a sense that as as we think of freedom of religion, as we think of of, of, of the of the Second Amendment rights uh, to guns. Um, and we think about First Amendment rights. You know, CRS. I think what they've done a one. What they've done uh, is value safety, right, and freedom of speech. That how do you allow protesters to protest, but also how do you maintain people's physical safety, emotion, you know, um, uh, safety here as well. There's a wonderful book that I've read recently when How Rights Go Wrong by Columbia Professor Jamal Green, which is about balancing rights which is about, but doing it by balancing interest, 
you, you know, whether on any issue that, that it's not about everybody having an absolute right. I think that's the best, best short answer I can give you, Harvey. And you can have, we can have a long conversation another time. Um, I'm sure. But we, how do we live together? I mean, I think we, we you know, people in this room and this uh, Zoom, Zoom conference value people rationally working things out so that we can live in peace and we can live in harmony. And, and I think, um, you, you know, I, I think some, I, the court's approach is absolutist, whether, and I, I'll get, you know, whether left or right, right, right. And therefore, so, uh, there's a fear I think all of us have, whether you're on the left or right of, boy, just get control of the Supreme Court and you know, just change it, change it all. But I think fundamentally, how, how do we balance the interest in fr fr first, a very clear one when we talk about the Baker's case and the you know LGBT couples and we having we have different cases now we have one about creating a website. How do we how do we figure out a way? As mediators, we can go. I bet people in this in this Zoom room can go in and figure out a solution that works. We have to look at it more contextually versus an absolutist. You know, it, really look at each situation, and, and that's the skill I would say that you know people in this room bring that I don't that I think the whole country could use a little more of. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for your answer. It was, it was a great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We, we have we have even more questions coming in um, and we have about four minutes left in our in our usual uh, standard time. So um, I guess before I ask you, I wanted to see if you if you wanted to, to provide any any kind of closing remarks or, or Maria, I don't know if you've asked uh, Grand if, if he's able to to stay a little bit longer, but uh, I wanted to, to pause to either give you a, a moment to kind of summarize or, or we can delve into the additional questions that are coming in. Well, Nikki, I just want to thank you. This has been a real pleasure. I, I mean, you, you guys got a, a great group. I didn't realize that you got, a, you know, people from all from Canada, people from all over, uh, all over the world. It's just been terrific to, to share, uh, share, share this work with you to to share the good work of, of CRS and others uh, who are doing this work today. I, I think it's an, 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 an important and critical time to be doing conflict resolution and mediation work. And I appreciate being um, in community uh, with, with, with all of you who do this work and to, to, to have the privilege of sharing, uh, you know, my experiences uh, with you all. So thank you, uh, Maria, for, 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 for running all these years. Thank you, Matthew, for the invitation. Nikki, I appreciate, uh, you know, the, your, your moderation today. And, and thank you everyone today for, 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 for joining. On behalf of all of us, Gren, can't thank you enough, um, particularly since you've been up since you know, <laughs> some ungodly hour called 4 a.m. to be with us. Um, uh, Gren joined us for the tech uh, part of the morning, which usually starts at 745 for the speaker. So thank you so much and thank you for your work. Uh, it's so important to shine the spot spotlight on the important work of CRS that I learned about at the beginning of my career. Um, I, I was always so impressed that the offices were so small and did such wonderful work, but yet it's sort of the hidden part of the kind of work that the Department of Justice does. Uh, of more, uh, more recently, we've heard a lot more about CRS, but for years, mm -hmm. uh, everyone thought that the Department of Justice would never even dream of having a unit like CRS, peacemakers in the community. Mm -hmm. Really wonderful. Our um, tradition here is to stop the recording at 10 a.m. sharp. Uh, as all of you know, uh, officially we adjourn the uh, October breakfast, right? Um, we will see you all in November. Uh, Grant, I didn't ask you if you're able to hang around for a few more minutes for any last informal questions or chat. Uh, I'm happy usually... to stay, stay, stay around for a few minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, difficult considering how long you've been up with us. But um, Nikki, if you could turn off the recording and uh, Brand will stay for a few minutes, let's say no more than 10 minutes. That way... Um, 
uh, we know when we're officially ending even this informal part of the morning. Thank you again. This has been wonderful. Thank you. We're stopping Thanks. the official recording now. Thanks. Mm -hmm.